It's great to have everyone with us. Um, it's always a pleasure to have our weekly class on the Parsha. We'll be learning the Zer Shimshon. We'll also be learning from Rabbi Ari Leib Heyman. And we are very excited to learn the last Torah portion in the book of Genesis and the book of Bereshit. Excited not because we're happy to be done with it, God forbid. Um, we've all been having so much fun with it. But on the contrary, we like feel a sense of accomplishment that we went through the first book. We're moving on to the book of Exodus, the book of Shemot. And if you want to hear the best part is next year we'll be able to start it all over again. And every year we go over and over. So Baruch Hashem. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I would like to thank tonight's sponsor. We have one sponsor. You know, normally we get more, but we take whatever comes. Um, Mr. Adam Reichenberg, who is sponsoring tonight's class in, in honor of his parents, Barry and Elisa Reichenberg, very close friends of ours, and also um, in honor for the easy delivery, Bezrat Hashem, for, her si for his sister, Yael, who is giving birth uh, very soon, I think even this month, in Eretz Yisrael. So may she have an easy delivery, healthy delivery, and only good things for the entire Reichenberg family and for all of our participants. Amen. With no further ado, we are starting this week's parsha. And before we get into the Zer Shimshon, I want to pay attention to something which is very, very noticeable in this week's Torah portion, more so than any Torah portion, because it is an anomaly. It is a one of. I'm going to share with you. Let's open this up. Okay. Now let's hope this comes out looking good on your screen. Someone's going to tell me how this looks. Does everyone see this? Yeah. This is the first page of this week's Torah portion, the way it looks like in the Torah. I wanted to give you a real experience this evening of what the Torah portion looks like in the Torah. Um, being that there is something which is very, very peculiar. I'm zooming into the first week word of this week's Torah portion. Does everyone see this over here? Vayechi Yaakov Be'eretz Mitzrayim. Do you see this Vayechi over here? So you see how there's a little space over here? There's different traditions on if there is even a little space or no space. Honestly speaking, there is no space. They're supposed to be right from the end of last week's Torah portion. It's supposed to go straight into this week's Torah portion with absolute no interruption at all. The, there are those, and this is the Sephardic tradition, to make a mini space, like a very small space, just so that it's easy for the Baal Koreh, the, the individual or the rabbi reading the Torah portion to find where it starts. But specifically speaking, this is considered to be a closed Torah portion. When we say closed, meaning it's not open in the fact like there's no, it's not starting at the beginning of the line or there's not a big indent before. That's what it means by it being a closed Torah portion. And the obvious question is why? This question is not my question. This question dates back to a long, long time ago. This question dates back to the Zohar. So the Zohar asks us exa that exact question. Why is our Torah portion closed? referred to as a parasha setuma, a closed Torah portion. So the, the Zohar gives no less than three answers to why this week's Torah portion is closed. There is no apparent indent or, or par, spaced paragraph. The first answer is given by Rabbi Yaakov. This is in the Zohar. And Rabbi Yaakov says that when, the, that when Jacob passes, again, Jacob passes away in this week's Torah portion. When Jacob passes away, the eyes of the Jewish people were dimmed. They were dimmed because they no longer had the connection to Jacob who illuminated the Jewish people with his light of Torah that he taught and that he shed upon them. Of course, they continued to learn Torah, but it was obviously not at the same magnitude that Jacob, their grandfather, or their father was able to provide them with. And for that reason, the Torah alludes to his great loss, which was a severe one, by having it as a closed Torah portion, similar to eyes which are closed. That's number one. Rabbi Yudah is the second answer the, the, the Zohar gives. And Rabbi Yudah says that when Jacob passes away, 
the Jewish people fell into exile. Now, even though physically they were already out of the land of Israel, um, it's been already some great time, 17 years, as we will read in this week's Torah portion, but they really didn't feel the exile so much because Jacob was still alive. Again, he was the last of our patriarchs. And as soon as he passed away, that's it. The J Egyptians started oppressing the Jewish people and they started for the first time feeling the exile. And that was a, a reason for, for there to be a close, for it to be something which was different and hard. The third answer the Zohar gives is Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon says that whenever there is not a space or an indent between verses or between paragraphs, such as the end of last week's Torah portion and the beginning of this week's Torah portion, it is to show a direct connection that whatever was going on previously in the previous portion, in the previous verse, is connected to this week's Torah portion. And how so? So let me show you on your screen. Okay. This is the first verse in this week's Torah portion. It says, Vayichi Yaakov, Be'eretz Mitzrayim, and Jacob lived in the land of Israel, Sheva Yisrael Shana, 17 years, and Vayimei Yaakov, Shene Chayav, Jacob lived, his total life was, seven years and 40 and 100 years, basically 147 years old. What precedes that verse, which is connected, because there's no space, there's no indent, is the following verse. It's chapter 47, verse 27. And Israel, this is referring to the children of Israel and Jacob and all his family. Um, they dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they acquired property in it, and they were prolific and multiplied greatly. So they were blessed. So the Zohar, according to Rabbi Shimon, is telling us that since Jacob was actually living along with his family and they all were prospering, they were multiplying, they were fruitful, Jacob finally lived a great life and the Jewish people were living a great life, a life of kings. It was the first time in Jacob's life that he actually was living a tranquil life. That's why when we are talking about the upcoming of his passing, we are referring to it as Vayechi Yaakov. Normally when a person dies, we say Vayamot, they passed. Not that they lived. So Jacob for the first time was living life. These 17 years were the only 17 years that he was actually living and enjoying his life. Mainly because of the company that he had and the viewing, the witnessing of the success of his, of his favorite son, Joseph, that's been gone for 22 years along with his children and his grandchildren, everyone together, I guess the only person really missing in this picture was his most favorite wife, Rachel. But since Joseph and also Benjamin, but specifically Joseph, lived and basically lived through her and, was, and came about because of his favorite wife, that was something which consoled him and he finally was living life. So that is the third reason for, the re for why there's no separation between the previous Torah portion and this week's Torah portion. Before I get into the session, Shon, there's one more thing I want to mention. And this is a, a basic observation. Um, we may have spoken about this in the past. And that is, each of our patriarchs, the Midrash says, we're supposed to live a total of 180 years. Now, to us, that is a very long time. But if we take things into perspective, into the years or the generations that preceded our patriarchs, it was maybe even on the lower end of things, right? With with Adam living in 930 years, and then many of their of the of the of them living three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred years. So there there definitely was a descent, a decline in and the longevity of humanity. Nevertheless, 180 years was what was allotted to each of our patriarchs. However, if we look at each of our patriarchs, there's only one of them that actually fulfilled that, I guess, promise or or that allotted time. If we look at Abraham, Abraham passes away at 175. 175, specifically five years early in order that he would not see the downfall of his son, sorry, of his grandson, Yitzchak's son, Esav. So Hashem preceded his passing by five years in order that he would pass away 
uh, tranquil, happy, and, and feeling fulfilled. Isaac lives 180 years. Very nice. Jacob lives 147. So why such a difference? What is the reason for that? So the Dad Zikinim, which is one of the Tosafot, he brings down that every word that Jacob complained when he met Paro in last week's Torah portion was accounted for and unfortunately used against him. And each word that he spoke actually diminished an entire year. He spoke 33 words. Well, we're soon going to address that in a moment. But 33 words were spoken. And all 33 words of those allotted to one year each, 180 minus 33 equals 147. And that's why Jacob passed away so early. Again, Paro asks him, wow, you look so old. You look like you had, you know, how, how old are you? What's going on? You know, let me bring up the verse. So this way, I'll, uh, I'll show you. Here we go. This is in last week's Torah portion. Vayomer, oh, where'd it go? Okay. Vayomer paro el Yaakov. This is chapter 47, verse 8. Paro says to, jo to, to Jacob, Kama yeme shene chayecha. How many are the days of the years of your life? So look at this. Jacob answers, Vayomer Yaakov el paro. Jacob says to paro, I'm 130 years old. Me'at v'raim. Now go sour. They are few and miserable. Hayu yemei shene chayai. Were the years, the days of my life. And I have not lived to the years of my my fathers, basically Abraham and Jacob, uh, Abraham and Isaac. So if we count these words, says the Dadzikini, let's look at this verse. One, okay, let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13 on the first line, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. So if I have 25 words over here, where does 33 come from? And that's a major question. So I don't know if you've heard this from me before or not, but a famous answer is look at the previous verse. How many words do we have here? One, two, three, four, and another four. That's eight. Eight plus 25 is your 33. That's a major issue we got over here. I understand if you want to hold Jacob accountable for his complaining, for his entire verse of complaining, 25 let words. But why is it that Paro's verse of eight words is also included? Jacob should have lived <coughs> 255. 180 years minus 25 words, 25 years less. But why those extra eight words that Pyro himself spoke? So listen to this answer. It's a very important answer. It's also a very important lesson for each and every one of us. And that is, what prompted Pyro to ask Jacob such a question? I don't know about you, but one of the rudest things you can ask someone is how old are you especially if that's the first thing you ask them it's like hi what's your name where are you from how old are you that's not proper etiquette that's not manners you know you ask them where are you from you know do you have any children what do you do for a living what's your favorite sport you know you you you, you kibitz you, you it takes time to foster a relationship before you can pop the big question of how old are you? But no, Paro holds nothing back. And you can't say, because, oh, Paro's the king. He can do or say whatever he wants. Paro revered Jacob. He understood that the father of this uh, amazing, amazing uh, Joseph must have been someone extremely, extremely special. No, no lightweight, no simple person. And nevertheless, he goes right for the kill, so to say, right for the punch. And he lunges in and asks him, how old are you? 
our sages say, why would Paro ever ask such a question? And the answer is, is that Jacob's appearance at his high level, again, whenever we speak about our patriarchs in a strong or maybe even negative light or punishable light or Moses or any of the great biblical characters in our Torah, we have to understand we are judging them at a very high level because that's how God judged them. And we learn from their lessons at our own level. So listen to the following. The only thing that would prompt Paro to ask such a rude question at the very first meeting that he has with jo with Jacob was Jacob's own appearance. It was the way he kept himself, the way he portrayed himself. And this is a tremendous lesson for us. You see, if Jacob would have, at his level, again, groomed himself, kept himself looking good and young, or at least happy, dressed well, Whatever, the, whatever, whatever ideas you want to put in your mind of what looking re representable was, Jacob was missing it at his high level. He unfortunately looked his age or he even looked older than his age. And that is because unfortunately, and we'll never, we don't never want to be tested with such a thing, but he was missing the love of his life, which was his son, Joseph, for 22 years, thinking that he was stolen and kidnapped or killed. He didn't even really understand. His son just vanished. He was so, so hard for him. And it was something that at his level, he should have been able to at least cope with or overcome. And that is why jo J um, Paro asked the question. It was Jacob's own appearance that prompted the question. And that is why Jacob was held accountable and years deducted from his 180 were the, year, were the words of Paro himself. So to use this as an introduction, again, the, the two first concepts we spoke about, number one is why is this considered a closed Torah portion? No separation. We gave three answers to the Zohar. And then now this idea of Jacob's age of passing away. Now the Zer Shimshon asks, what I consider an obvious question. The question is, how is it that the Torah says, Jacob lived, but it's speaking that he's passing away. Okay, fine. So when I tell you in the past that someone lived, okay, even though we said that this is the first time he was actually living, but lived means in the past. Okay. I'm telling you, Jacob lived, meaning he's dying or he died at 147, but he actually lives for a long time more. And we speak about a lot more of his life, or at least the end of his life, in this week's Torah portion, before he actually passes away at the end of the Torah portion. So yes, I know it's the beginning of the portion, and okay, we're, let's 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 name this Torah portion: Jacob passing away. But he passes away at the end of the Torah portion. The verse should not say that he passes away and he lives 147 when he has more time to live. The Zerushim Shun proves this question. Take a look at your screen. So again, the first Torah, the first verse is that Jacob is 147 when he passes away after living 17 years in the land of Egypt. Then the next verse says, oh, now he's coming time to pass away. This is in 4729. And he calls his son Joseph and he asks him, oh, please make sure, take an oath and bury me in the land of Israel. Make sure don't bury me here in Egypt. Later on, in the beginning of the next chapter, chapter 48, it says, And behold, it was after these incidents. And as the Zerashim Shon says, anytime it says, It means that some time passed. It wasn't a couple of hours, it wasn't a couple of days. It was a considerable amount of time passed. And then Joseph tells his father, Oh, father, we see you're old and sick. Let's now... Um, has, it was told to Joseph that his father's sick and then that he should bring his two sons, Menashe and Ephraim, to get a blessing. Again, it seems clearly, the Zerashim Shon says from our verses in the Torah, that Jacob does not pass away right away. Why are we saying he passes away and then say so much more about him during his lifetime? Okay, that is the Zerashim Shon's basic question. He asks it in a couple different ways mm -hmm. and he answers straight to the point and he says, the Torah lists the life or the years of the life of Jacob right at the beginning of the Torah portion 
to prove to us, and then goes on to again, continue to speak about his life, how he's alive, to prove to us exactly what the Talmud in Masechet Tani, page 5b tells us, that Jacob never died. As much as the Torah writes about Jacob's passing away, he actually never died. He would remain alive forever. Now, I got a big issue with this. This is not my issue. So let's just, just play, this, play this out. The Zeshitzon's question is, why are we saying Jacob dies if the Torah says so much more about him? And he says, well, you know why? Because he actually dies, but he never really died. He never really died, just as the Talmud tells us that Jacob never dies. So it doesn't matter if we say that he died at the beginning of the Torah portion, in the middle, or the end. He never really died. Hmm. What does that mean? How does it mean that Jacob never died? We read about having a eulogy, a burial. What's really going on over here? The Midrash has a whole showdown with Esav coming and claiming the burial spot. It's clearly evident from our Torah and our sages that Jacob passed away and was buried. Yet he never really dies? What, what, what's going on? Am I missing something? Someone help me over here. Okay. The Maharsha asks this question. The Maharsha is one of the great commentaries in our Talmud. And he answers the question in an amazing, maybe seemingly obvious way, but there is a, a, a spin on this. Listen to this. He says, Jacob's body obviously expired in this world. Yes. But his soul continued to live forevermore with his children and his grandchildren. But then he goes on to say, so why specifically Jacob and not Abraham and Isaac? Like, what was different? And I'm going to tell you now something so, so special. This is something that all, all of us as parents can strive to accomplish in our lifetime as parents, during parenthood, and even way later on. There's a great difference between the relationships of Abraham and his children, Isaac and his children, and Jacob and his children. And that is that Abraham, he had one child that he was connected to, that was considered successful, his successor, that was Isaac. And one that wasn't, Ishmael. Isaac had the same thing. He had one child as his successor, Jacob, and he had another child that wasn't, that's Esav. Jacob was different. All 12 of his children, at least the boys, of course, Dina as well, all of his children, however you want to calculate them, they were all connected to their father. They were all successors of, his, of their father. That means that if a parent in his lifetime or her lifetime is at peace and successful with all of their children at whatever level they are, Right? We've had and heard about bumpy roads with the tribes themselves. Whether it be Levi and Shimon, whether it be Judah, even Joseph, whatever it may be. But if at the end of the day, they are all at peace with their parents and the parents are at peace with all of their children, then they have the merit to continue living with them. Even after they are physically gone, they're able to spiritually be there forevermore. Now, look how ironic this is. Jacob has 12 children. Sorry, 12 boys and Dina, at least. If you don't go according to the Midrashim, that he had multiple more. But at least if he had 13 children and he was at peace with all of them. And we look at Abraham who had two and he was a one for two ratio. And Isaac as well, one for two ratio. You may think that, oh, having less children may give me a better relationship with my children. Maybe give me a better success rate. That's not the way it works. I'm not saying that we have to have 12 or 13 children to have all of our children to love us or, or to, be, to be at peace with us or for us to be at peace with them. It's a, it's a, it's a two-way relationship. But... It doesn't mean that if you have only one child or two children, oh, then it's going to all be. No, every person has to do their shtadlut, their effort to have as many healthy, well-rounded children that they can bring to this world. 
but it's striving for that relationship which can transcend beyond physical life and move on into spiritual life that can now allow the parent when they pass away to continue living with and blessing their children. This is a fascinating concept. This is what the Zeshim Shan means that Jacob never died. And that's why you could say Jacob dies at the beginning, the middle, the end. It doesn't matter because he really never died. So he, yeah, we say he died, but we continue to speak about his life because even when his body expires, it never is really gone. It's a beautiful, beautiful concept. I want to share with you something. And even though this may be in a public form, it's still pretty much closed. I'm doing a funeral tomorrow for a family. I won't mention their name. About a, not about, for a, a man, 90-year-old father who passed away th- today. Funeral taking place tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. This man has seven, had seven children. Okay. He had his ups and downs. I, I, I only met the man once, a couple, two years ago. I'm close with one of his sons. So the man had his first wife and he had three children with him. Second wife, another three children. And then he had his third wife and had one child. And one thing we could say about this individual is maybe he wasn't such a good husband, wasn't able to maintain, you know, a relationship for so long, or at least an everlasting one with a spouse. Or maybe he just chose very difficult women. Who knows? I wonder which one it was. Either way. But after speaking to two of his children today, the eldest and another one of the sons, it was very clear that their f- entire life of their father, that, he, that, that the relationships that they had with him, was ups and downs. And that's okay, because that's very often how it is when you have many children, especially the father who is a very opinionated individual. That's fine. But one thing that they're all saying, all the children, and I'm going to meet them all tomorrow, is that towards the end of their father's life, they all feel as sad as it is to lose their father, even at 90 years old, they all feel like they are at peace or that he was at peace with them, that they all had last communications and conversations, which were all peaceful, even though in his youth and the younger was yelling and screaming and yes, talking and no talking and drama. We, we all know about these type of things, but he was able to, in his wisdom and his patriotic position of having so many children and, and so many grandchildren able to end off at peace with all of his children to the point where they all felt like he was departing from them in, in, a, in a good place. And that's something which is amazing to strive for. Meaning, of course, our whole life, because we never know when we'll pass, right? But as parents, we don't know when we'll go but at least to always end off in a great way, in a peaceful way. Because again, just like Jacob had his up and downs with his children in in some way, but at his deathbed, he blessed them. He was with them. They were at peace with him. He was at peace with them. And that's what gave him the great power to continue living through them. So may we all merit that when we pass away at 120, that we will be able to continue to live on in our children and grandchildren and with them because we were connected to all of them. And that's all we can actually do as parents. You know, when our children are young, we're there to educate them, so to say, by leading by example, sometimes imposing too much on them, hopefully not. And teaching them the right way, setting them up with a proper amount of confidence and success. But at a certain point, there's, there's only so much we can keep on teaching and educating and, and even leading by example. So we always resort to prayer. But what we can always do, and this is dependent on us as parents, is keeping the peace with our children 
and even keeping that beautiful relationship, that open relationship, that feeling of we're always there for our children, that feeling of nobody can ever replace us as a parent. And that is that open connection that will hopefully spiritually live on in our children and our grandchildren forevermore. But it's something as parents we have to work on, we have to strive for. And if we wouldn't have this opportunity to speak about it through the words of the Zer Shimshon and the Talmud and the Marsha and all of what we spoke about this evening, we may not have ever thought of. So hopefully with the help of God and with the help of the Zer Shimshon and the Torah study that we, we study on a weekly basis, we may strive for that, strive for that at peace feeling with all of our children, which will hopefully allow us to give them merit by living on spiritually in them and through them forevermore.